thank you everybody for joining us. It's wonderful to have you all from your homes and um, and all over the place. So that's great. I am Sarah Gladue. I'm the Director of Education and Citizen Science for Coastal Rivers Conservation Trust. And <clears throat> excuse me, um, I'd like to introduce this is Kathleen Thornton and she can introduce herself. Hi, thanks for coming. I'm Kathleen Thornton. I'm a research specialist with the University of Maine Darling Marine Center. I also manage the analytical laboratory there. Um, the Darling Marine Center is the main marine lab for the University of Maine and we're located in Walpole, which is south of Damariscotta. I um, grew up very close to here in Waldeboro. Um, and I'm very happy to be here today um, to join you all and talk about coastal acidification. And I'm going to hand it off to Sarah to do the introductory um, slides and kind of get you oriented to what we're talking about. So take it away, Sarah. Thank you. So um, the way this will work is, as Kathleen was alluding, I'll, I'll start us off and then Kathleen is going to be sharing some of the data that she's done analysis for um, this organization called the Maine Coastal Observing Alliance that we are part of. Um, and a number of you who are on this call are involved in one way or another following uh, the Maine Coastal Observing Alliance and the data that we're gathering, which is, which is great. Uh, we do have a website and that will be shared along with our contact information at the end. I'm going to ask that all the participants go ahead and mute themselves um, so we don't have any conflicting noises. That would be very helpful. And then uh, feel free to use the chat, which I will try to monitor. Um, and Kathleen will do the same. So if everyone would just do chat to every to chat everyone, that way, um, if there are comments or questions, we can um, we can work them into the program as we need to, or attend to them at the end. So that would be that'll be helpful. Um, okay, I'm just gonna pull the chat up so I can see it. At any rate. Um, yeah, so we're going to be talking about coastal acidification in um, the mid-coast of Maine. And we're going to start off um, talking about what the issues are and what coastal acidification is. We'll go into a little bit about what MCOA is, the Maine Coastal Observing Alliance, and what we do and how we do it. And we're really fortunate tonight. Um, Celeste Mosier is online with us, and Celeste is the technician. and so. The details of actually what we do and how we do it um, can be explained by her if we have um, questions about specific sites or things that she sees when she's on the water. She's actually the person who is on the water collecting the, the data um, and using the equipment and working with volunteers who support all, all of this. Um, without the volunteers, uh, the boat captains, we would uh, we, we wouldn't be able to access the areas we need to access. So we're very thankful to all our volunteers. I know um, a few of them are online today and that's, that's helpful. Uh, the data and information is what Kathleen is gonna be talking about. So she does the analysis for us. She's the scientist on board with this or one of, the, one of several scientists who provide technical expertise. Um, and so we are extremely fortunate to have this uh, ongoing relationship. And as I said, we'll, we'll share our website and contact information at the end. And certainly if there's any um, questions, we can go on. Kathleen and I are thinking this will take about um, somewhat less than an hour and then there'll be time for questions. So we had said four to six uh, loosely, I think, in an original, um, but we didn't want to hold anyone to a chair that long. And, uh, and in this environment, it's particularly hard, especially when fishing might stay here. So. Um, Continue. Whoops. Uh oh. I'm not going to have problems with my computer jumping. Sometimes it does. So uh, I think it's best to start sometimes with the, the measurements and what they mean. And, and uh, so we need to understand what the pH scale is. Uh, the scale is just a, um, a measurement of the concentration of hydrogen ions in a solution. And in this case, we're focused on ocean or uh, coastal waters. Uh, the scale is somewhat confusing if it's not something you work with on a regular basis because it's logarithmic 
And um, so each each value, you know, five, six, seven, um, there's actually a tenfold difference uh, between between each value, which means that um, especially when you're talking about organisms that are sometimes sensitive or have times in their life cycle when they are particularly sensitive, then um, a tenfold difference or even a, a small part of that can, can be extremely difficult for them um, in terms of attaining their life cycle. So there's a little diagram on the bottom of the scale. Uh, first of all, seven is neutral and acidic is less than seven. And, and the alkaline or basic values are greater than seven. And then um, there's a nice schematic on the bottom of this that kind of shows if you have a, a pH of eight in seawater, um, you, know, you have the neutral value of pH seven, and it's just sort of a, um, a diagram to show what the, what the relative difference is um, in quantities. And there you have rainwater at, at a natural rainwater at the pH of six. So you can just, get a kind of a feel for what the difference is in terms of the value of the pH scale. And hopefully Kathleen will chime in whenever she, um, as the scientist here, likes to, would like to, um, to help us understand further. But Yeah, well, I'll just pipe in with a little comment. Well, um, first, I'm having a little bit of difficulty hearing you. Is anyone else having any trouble or is that me? I am. It's it's very it's all gar it's very garbled. Oh really? Yeah. It's crackling. Um, it's crackling a little bit. Perhaps if sometimes if you meet, uh, yeah let your me, video. Yeah. I'm happy to do that. Okay. Now, I'm glad yeah. you mentioned that. So how is that? Is that any better? It sounds better to me. Yeah, me too. Okay, good. All right, we'll go with that. Okay, and the uh, the only other thing I wanted to comment on is that the other confusing thing about pH scale is as things get more acidic, the pH gets lower. So you have more acid, more hydrogen ions, which is a measure of acid um, as the scale gets lower. And we'll just keep that in mind as we go through the rest of the slides. Excellent. That's very good. So here's a diagram of what ocean acidification, which is different than coastal acidification, looks like. But a schematic showing you where you have um, atmospheric carbon dioxide. And I'll use my, my pointer here to show it's, it's dissolving into the water and um, reacting with the water. And so you have carbonic acid as a, as a result. Um, and then that goes ahead and, and there's further dissolution on the other side where you're, you're left with these um, ions, which are what actually make the water more acidic over time. Okay. Um, and then this lower diagram here shows you the pH scale on the bottom. And, um, and then it's explaining the, um, the um, the change that happens when you have carbonic acid and showing that you have less availability of, um, of the shell forming material over time when you have more of this carbonic acid. So one of the big impacts, of course, is of, of ocean acidification and coastal acidification is that you're going to have issues with some of the organisms that are forming shells and as that happens, um, they they lose the ability to form that shell, and so actually it even it shows that on the on the on the uh, the upper diagram as well, where you've got these deformed shells falling <laughs> down, um, and that's what this lower diagram is also. Okay. Um, so a little bit more about why we should care. And um, as I was saying, these organisms that use calcium carbonate, they lose the ability to form these shells. And there's a vast variety of organisms that use the calcium carbonate to, to protect themselves and for other functions um, within their life cycle. And so everything from very microscopic 
plankton to the bivalves like clams and oysters and so forth. Um, and so that's part of what we're, we're concerned about. A lot of those organisms form the basis of food webs, they perform filtering mechanisms, and they have a wide variety of, of um, functions um, within each ecosystem. In the center there, we have a picture of Bill Mook. Um, he's a local aquaculturist of Mook Sea Farm. And he's done a huge amount of work locally to look at um, the impact of the young oysters uh, related to, to um, changes in the acidity in the water. And we don't know the full impact. We don't have enough information to know, for example, throughout the life cycle of the oyster. But um, Bill has seen some significant changes and um, related to the, to the shell formation of young, very small oysters, seed oysters. And, um, so that has led him to uh, change his practices in his nursery and create a situation where he has buffered water so that those very young oysters are, are able to grow. Um, before he brings them out into the estuary. So the Gulf of Maine, um, let's just sort of orient ourselves a little bit further here. Um, the Gulf of Maine has these currents that move around and you can, you can see the um, counterclockwise currents that are moving, the eastern Maine coastal currents, so then the Western Maine coastal current, and it's these currents move and they retain this water. Um, the continental shelf kind of drops off here uh, to the right, right bottom right corner, and so you've got this basin where the water is retained for you know over a year in some cases, and um, there is respiration of phytoplankton that's happening within the Gulf of Maine, and so that input of the of the um, uh, the phytoplankton oxygen <laughs> is um, you know it's all having impact on the solubility of the carbon dioxide in this environment and um, the inputs of the pressure water that come from these estuaries all throughout the coast and are discharged into the Gulf of Maine um, are local inputs of, of potentially low pH river water and um, so you have an environment here in the Gulf of Maine where we have um, specific conditions that make us particularly concerned about the potential uh, for coastal acidification to have impact just because of the topography and the existing um, water hydrology of the, of the area. I have trouble finding my arrows to move this forward, I'm sorry. So just in terms of a diagram that looks at the, um, at, the, at the estuary itself. So an estuary is any place where you have a river flowing into the ocean and you have the mixing of the salt water and the freshwater environment um, and fresh water is coming off the landscape. So for example, this is a diagram showing a potential uh, sewage treatment plant and you've got a home and you've got a yard and you've got um, vehicles and potential erosion and runoff um, and runoff from fertilizer. There's there's all of these impacts um, that have the potential to change the water chemistry. And we'll talk about specifically more what's going on in our immediate mid coast Maine. Um, a couple of things that are important to note, and one is that uh, we pay a particular attention right now to nutrients and runoff. Um, that can cause this algae growth, just like when we um, fertilize the garden and you get growth of your plants. Well, if you fertilize the ocean, if you fertilize the coastal environment, you get growth of plants, which in this case tend to be the phytoplankton and the algae. And so these algae are consuming oxygen, uh, I'm sorry, producing oxygen, and when they die, they are uh, consumed by bacteria. And when the bacteria are consuming, are consuming the um, plankton, they're also consuming oxygen and releasing carbon dioxide, which has the potential to increase acidification. There are all kinds of potential um, relationships between runoff 
um, off the landscape. But coastal acidification specifically is related to the the land-based activities that are um, impacting the water. And so in the open ocean, you, you simply don't have um, these kinds of inputs and uh, in the estuaries you do. So it's a trade off to Kathleen now and she's gonna talk further about exactly how that, how that happens and, and, um, and what we're looking at locally. Okay, I'm going to also turn off my video. Um, and if anybody has any trouble, please just put it on the chat and um, any trouble hearing me. So this is just a really simple schematic to kind of um, emphasize what Sarah was talking about. When we hear about ocean acidification, we um, often think about global CO2 levels and the, the open ocean. And that is true that, that ocean acidification is primarily affected by atmospheric CO2 levels. And that does have some effect on coastal acidification, but most, the most significant factor in coastal acidification is anthropogenic, which just means people of origin, um, nutrients that come from land. And they, in this schematic, you can see the nutrients coming into the water with a green arrow. Now, when we talk about nutrients in estuaries, we're talking specifically about nitrogen. And the reason for that is in estuaries and coastal waters, with few exceptions in this part of the world, um, the growth of those little algal cells is controlled by nitrogen because they already have everything else they need. So it's like, you know, the fertilizer in the garden. If you're low nitrogen, you add that nitrogen, things take off. It's the same thing here. And over eons, these algal cells have adapted um, to take quick advantage of any nitrogen that hits that water because naturally nitrogen comes into the estuaries in spurts after a rainfall. Even if you've ever seen a, a bog where you have that deep humic, like it almost looks like tea, that's a natural nutrient input. And when the rains come, that's flushed out. So over the millennia, um, these cells have developed the ability to grow really fast whenever they have that nitrogen. So we put nitrogen in and they grow really fast and uh, they're like um, land-based plants. They photosynthesize, which is mean they grow, they get the material, carbon material for growth um, by using the sun, sun's energy. So they grow really fast. And because they need light, they grow near the surface. And they, they take in CO2 and they give off oxygen. So you'll often see at the surface in these estuaries, very high oxygen levels. And that sounds great. You know, why would anybody, why would that be a problem? But the problem is when the cells die, they're, a lot of them are heavy, they sink to the bottom. I mean, heavy in terms of float or sink. So they sink to the bottom and they rot and bacteria degrade them. And rot is kind of the opposite of photosynthesis. You can think of it that way. Things break down, they give off CO2 and they, they need oxygen, they take up the oxygen. So that happens at the bottom and it happens in varying degrees depending on the nutrient runoff and, and the currents in a place. So if you have a place where there's a lot of flushing of this material, a lot of water movement, you can flush it all away and it will mix um, well and maybe not cause such a problem. But when it, it goes to the bottom and sits there is when we have problems. And if you see that little, there's a little black line through the slide, uh, horizontal line, that's representing something that, that happens in estuaries and coastal areas where some parts of the year you have a layering of the water. So it, we call it stratification, and there are various other names for that layer, but we don't really need to go into the details. But um, that happens because you have dense water that, that's at the bottom, so it doesn't want to come up because it's dense. And the lighter 
water want less dense water wants to stay on top. And there are two uh, factors that control that. One is that that density. One of them is temperature. So things water becomes more dense when it gets cold. When you heat water, it expands. If you heat it enough, it boils away. When you cool it, it condenses. Um, so cold water sinks. The other is um, seawater. So the salts in seawater cause that water to be heavier. So, oops. Uh oh. Uh oh. I think <laughs> it did that by itself. Can we go backwards? Hang on. So I'll just keep talking. And you, um, so seawater is heavier than fresh water. And what happens in, um, there we go. What happens in estuaries often is the fresh water will come down from the river that feeds the estuary and it, it will glide over the top of the seawater that's coming in and out with the tides. So you can set up the stratification. And that's bad because it kind of holds all that low oxygen water at the bottom and high CO2 water. And as Sarah showed in the slide below, when you have a lot of CO2, you get a lower pH, more acidity. Um, and that just sits there at the bottom. Now on the, on the lower right corner, um, there's some little arrows coming up that um, say upwelling, CO2 rich, deep Gulf of Maine water, <coughs> excuse me. And that is, can be a, an issue in Maine. Um, the same process happens offshore and in the Gulf of Maine when you have a bloom. And that deep water, um, it, the, it takes a long time for oxygen to diffuse down to the deep water and all of that material sinks. And sometimes if you have a storm event that causes that, or there can be other reasons, but say a storm event causes that deep water to come up to the surface that exacerbates this problem because you're combining the coastal waters, that deep layer with the offshore wa waters. And you've um, probably heard about this more on the West Coast because we, like Sarah said, the Gulf of Maine is a basin and it's roughly, I may be a little bit off, but like in terms of feet, 450, 500 feet deep, but once you drop down off that continental shelf, the average depth of the Atlantic, I think is 10 or 11,000 feet. So on the West Coast, they don't have the basin. So you're looking at that deep water upwelling right against the coast. And that drives a lot of their acidification events. Whereas we have um, more localized events in the Gulf of Maine. Um, so uh, we want to keep that in mind as we go through the data that sometimes we see this stratification and it can really have an influence on how bad that uh, or how low that pH gets. And I think you can go on to the next slide for real. <laughs> <laughs> so this is some real data from Booth Bay. This is the Maine Coastal Observing Alliance data. And I apologize because those red um, station markers are a little bit off. Um, I think I moved the the underlying map without grouping it, with it, but they're close but not exact. So those are kind of representative of where the the sampling was done. And and Celeste, who's we here with us, um, actually collected this data. So these are profiles. Um, where we take, or Celeste took an instrument and lowered it down into the water and took pH readings from bottom to top. And what you see is a little graph there. This was Booth Bay, our Booth Bay site, September 25th, 2019. On the, the left side, that's depth from top to bottom. So you're looking at the side of the profile as if you were floating in the water looking at it. And the x-axis is pH. So one thing that's pretty clear on most of these stations is that the first two or three meters, things look pretty stable. And then you hit this layer where suddenly pH is dropping. This is an example of what can happen with this stratification. 
So on September 25th, 2019, there was some sort of stratification in most of these sites. Stratification often happens in August, or July, August, September, where you don't have a lot of big storms coming in, like in the spring and the fall, to mix things up. It's warm, things get a little stagnant, and these layers can develop. So what I've done is pick out uh, Booth Bay 4, and we're going to look in a little bit more detail about the data from Station 4 on the next slide. So these are the top graphs, four graphs across the top are all set up the same way as the one we were just looking at. So the left axis is depth from surface to bottom. And across the top from left to right, we just have different parameters. The first one is the pH on the left, which we've already seen. Next to that is dissolved oxygen. And no surprise, they look very similar. And that's because of this process we were just talking about where you have um, rot or degradation taking the oxygen out of the water and uh, lowering the pH, increasing the CO2. It's a lot easier to measure dissolved oxygen than it is CO2. So we measure dissolved oxygen. Salinity doesn't, I mean, there's a little difference, but there's very little change in salinity. Temperature, though, seems to follow the same pattern. So if you recall, I said there's two things that can affect the density of seawater and set up those layers. One is salinity and one is temperature. And from looking at these data, I would say it was temperature that was mainly driving the stratification because salinity goes from, you know, 31.2 to 31.5. It's not much of a change, right? So, but temperature changes pretty significantly. So these are the kind of data that, that we have for all of the MCOA stations, and it's really vital information to understand these systems. One thing that we can do further with these data sets is what I've done on the bottom. Um, and I, these graphs have, have pH on the x-axis, and then one of the other parameters on the y-axis. So the first one on the left, pH on the x-axis and dissolved oxygen um, on the y-axis. Obviously, they're related. If you, if you graph parameters like this and you see a straight line, that means that they're definitely interacting, right? They're, they're co-varying, in this case, in a positive way. So when the pH is high, the oxygen's high. When the pH is low, the oxygen's low. That's just what we've been talking about. So this is an example of, of what can happen with coastal acidification and how we can see it in our water quality data. And on the right side, I've done the same thing with pH and temperature. You can also see that there's a pretty good relationship between pH and temperature, which is another clue where we're sleuthing everything out here. And that's another clue that this density gradient is driven by temperature in this case. And I think we're ready for the next slide, Sarah. Kathleen, I'll just say that at, um, there's a question in the chat about oh, sure. specifically how um, global warming impacts um, processes around carbon dioxide absorption. So I don't know if you want to just say something specifically about that related uh, related to that particular question. Yep. Um, well, it can. It's it's a complicated um, interaction with global climate change. The effect of um, the CO two increasing atmospheric CO two levels in the Gulf of Maine. Um, is expected to be, and I, I'm going to get this wrong if I say it, but it's, it's 0.2 pH units um, perhaps over the next 100 years. And that, that can be a big difference in some places, but if you, if you look at this pH in one station, we're going from 8.2 to 7.8. So in coastal areas, the signal from coastal acidification, which is from nutrient input in coastal areas, way out, it, it just masks the change that we would see from atmospheric CO2 levels. 
Now, in the deep ocean, that's a big problem because those systems aren't, they didn't evolve over millions of years to handle pH changes like that. So that's a, a big issue. For coastal organisms, um, they have evolved with fresh water coming in and out in a very dynamic system. So they're a little bit more um, able to handle this, but we are seeing um, much greater changes from the nutrient input effect of pH than we are from um, global CO2 levels on the coast here. And that's not true on every coast everywhere, but for right here, um, it is. Great, thank you, Kathleen. That helps understand, I think, a lot more about coastal acidification and how it is somewhat different from ocean right. acidification. Right, right, it is different. So I'm gonna go ahead and give you the next slide. Okay, so here's, we're going back to some of these inputs. This is actual data from Casco Bay, which is where our biggest city is here in Maine. And it's pretty evenly split between human sewage, wastewater treatment plants in the form of nitrate or ammonium. Those two are um, what we call inorganic forms of nitrogen. Atmospheric deposition from all of the stuff that it can be particulate and um, gases in the atmosphere that are uh, going into the Casco Bay and non-point source runoff. That includes farms, lawns, streets, dog poop, um, all that stuff, people that throw trash in the road ditch. All of that is non-point source runoff. But again, this is kind of discouraging, right? Uh, we talk about ocean acidification, coastal acidification. Is like, it just seems so overwhelming, but look at look at these look at the sources there are very few of those that we don't have local control over so the hopeful message in fighting coastal acidification is we can we can locally have get better treatment plants if we petition for them thomaston did that and it the saint george river from went from being com almost completely closed to being one of the highest social clam harvests in the state. We can do something about that. On the bottom, non-point source runoff. We can be careful about how our garbage and oil from our cars and manure from our horse and poop from our dogs, you know, what we do with it. Do we just, or if we live near the water particularly, it does make a big difference. It doesn't seem like much, but if you, if you have a hundred dogs pooping next to the river <laughs> over a year, that adds up to a lot. So we can do something about that. Vehicle emissions, we can do something about that. So, so there is a hopeful message in this and that we can um, have a local effect. We can make change locally to improve um, coastal acidification. I think I am ready for the next slide. All right. Ah. So this is a little satellite map of um, ammonium in Casco Bay. And in this case, I was testing out a real time sensor. So we have an ammonium sensor you can have in a boat, you have a pump and you're pumping water through all the time and it's doing continuous readings of ammonium. And this again, just shows um, the, I'm sorry, the, the darker the red, the more ammonium there, are, there is. And you can see how localized some of these inputs are. Um, in the lower left upstream was the South Portland sewage treatment plant. So you can see we were kind of getting into that. But um, again, it goes back to we can all do our part to clean up these small sources and they all add up to, to cause coastal acidification. But every mitigation we can do helps. And to the right, you see two pie charts. And I want to just go into a little bit of detail about the kind of uh, nutrients we're talking about. And what MCOA measures is total nitrogen. And we remember we said that nitrogen is lacking in most of these areas. So when you add it, things take off. 
and there are different forms of nitrogen, but total nitrogen is a really good kind of bellwether measurement because it's going to be high if there's high ammonium, if there's high nitrate, any kind of high nutrient input, you're going to see it in the total nitrogen. So you do that first. That's your survey parameter. And if you see something high, then if you have the funding and you, you the desire, you can go back and do more tests to find out exactly what it is. So we most of the testing we do breaks down nitrogen into what we call organic and inorganic. Inorganic is nitrate and ammonium for the most part. And those can come from sewage treatment plants, they're dissolved, they can come from fertilizer, from industrial uh, sources. And then you have organic nitrogen, which is basically um, anything that was came from anything that was living. So all that rot that we talked about, the cells rotting, um, you know, if somebody's throwing fish waste into the Casco Bay, then you're going to get different um, organic nitrogen forms released, bacteria release them. So I want to point out how different um, different areas of the coast can be. At top is the site we had in Swans Island, and 60% of the total nitrogen was nitrate. A small bit was ammonium, and about a third was organic. In the Damariscotta River, on the same, very close to the same date, 87% of the total nitrogen is organic. And we see that time after time after time in the Damariscotta. The Damariscotta is different <laughs> in that regard from most places that we sample. We're not really sure why that is, but nitrate is usually very low, ammonium is usually very low, unless the L wives are running, and then it's quite high um, up in Great Salt Bay from all the fish. Um, it may have something to do with the oyster, the millions of oysters that are in the Damariscotta River, but we just don't know. But I want to just point out why it's really important to have a group like MCOA, where you have really involved, concerned people in each watershed and in each coastal area and estuary, because you know what we find out in Swans Island is totally irre irrelevant to Damariscotta, and we, and we really need to have the data be very specific so we can understand each individual system and the only way to have the manpower to do that is through citizen science and groups like MCOA. Okay, Sarah, we can go to the next one. Okay. Oh, we're back to Sarah. So <laughs> I will mute myself. Hang on, bear with me. Okay. Um, so yeah, we, Kathleen has sort of steered us in this direction of thinking about the Midcoast Maine estuaries and um, and the people that live there and what they contribute to, to this organization. But specifically the estuaries I'm gonna talk about for a moment, um, they're all very different and they, the amount of fresh water that's coming out of them is considerably different. The Kennebec versus the Madomic, for example, is vastly different. And so the buffering capacity is, you know, related to, to the fresh water is, is, is orders of magnitude different sometimes um, from one place to another. And then, for example, if you look at the Sheepscot, um, the Sheepscot here has relatively few islands and it's a very deep and narrow channel and you know compare that to some of these other estuaries where you have a lot of barriers to water that's flowing um, along the coast and coming in with the tides and so those barrier islands oh that's not what I was trying to do I'm sorry um, those barrier islands do create a situation where you have a difference in the water chemistry and a difference in the temperatures um, as they as they come in as the waters come in and out with the tides. Um, so anyway, to, to, to just to close up with that is to say that the the estuaries themselves are very different, and uh, those of you who have been out on them um, probably can attest to that. They feel different. Uh, the currents feel different, and the photography 
topography makes them feel quite different um, over time. So because they are so different, we can't just sit in our in our one estuary and monitor what's going on there and assume that we can kind of extrapolate across the entire region. We simply can't do that. And so um, because of that, the various water quality monitoring groups all up and down the coast, most of them tied to either a land trust or a conservation commission or some other um, nonprofit, uh, have d been doing their own monitoring projects for a long time in some cases in order to understand specifically what goes on in their estuary and how can they um, support what industry is going on on the river, for example, aquaculture or fishing uh, on behalf of the community and how can they be engaged with the organizations and the community around water quality. So that's been going on for quite a long time all up and down the coast. However, in 2014, a group of us got together and decided that we really needed to be able to compare data across from, um, from one estuary to another. And so we formed the Maine Coastal Observing Alliance and we're focused on a few key questions. Uh, ocean acidification or coastal acidification really is driving a lot of our work. Um, all of these organizations continue to do their own local monitoring projects. So in, in one place, they're looking at shellfish related issues and another place they might be looking at aquaculture related issues and in another place, they might be looking at, at um, farming impacts and, and, and other kinds of um, land use related issues. So there's a, a wide variety, but the um, MCOA or the Maine Coastal Observing Alliance is focused on trying to understand what is happening over time from, from in all of these estuaries and um, what, what is coming from the sea uh, and what is coming from the land. And, trying to parse that out. And then what can we do? Um, as Kathleen was saying, it's really important for us all to be able to um, take action on these, on these uh, aspects of this coastal acidification that we know that we can control, that we know we have um, the ability on a local level to do real work and have meaningful results. And so, um, you know, and then if we do it, how do we know that we've been successful? If we go out and we and we make some big community-wide change, how do we know that that had the desired impact on water quality? And the, the best way for us to do that is, is to gather data and to make sure that data is, high, you know, very quality controlled, um, very, very good, reliable data that we've collected over a long period of time so that we know um, we have a good big picture perspective. And uh, any of you who have been involved with water monitoring projects know that, that uh, funding is always complicated <laughs> because um, it's hard to, it's hard to um, fund a program that, that has to collect information forever. <laughs> and we, we, can't, we can't stop because um, as one of, as Larry Mayer says, one of our technical team, once, once you, if you don't collect the data, then that water has gone by. It literally has gone under the bridge. And so, um, you know, we feel it's really important to continue this work. So, um, the Maine Coastal Observing Alliance has a number of sites. And to the um, one side of your screen, you see FOCB, that's Friends of Casco Bay. And then you see the, the Kennebec Estuary Land Trust. And the Sheepscot River is monitored. Um, in, with support from the um, Mid Coast um, Conservancy, and then there's the Booth Bay Regional Land Trust, and here in the middle, this is Coastal Rivers Conservation Trust, with, for whom I work. The Madomic is also a Mid Coast Conservancy, and then um, we have actually in this area we have Friends of the West Keg, and then the St. George, and um, it's the St. George uh, River Land Trust, I'm sorry, the Georges River Land Trust. And then up here in Rockport, we have the Rockport um, Harbor and Rockport uh, uh, Conservation Committee, and then the Belfast group up here. This is uh, some of our newest, our newest uh, collection of data is from Belfast area.
So what do we do? Um, well, a lot of this that I'm going to talk about is what Celeste does. So Celeste, you may certainly chime in if you wish. But um, Celeste goes out with a volunteer boat captain and she collects data on dissolved oxygen, temperature, salinity, transparency. She, uses, she collects um, the pH data and total nitrogen, which is analyzed by Kathleen at the lab at the Darling Marine Center. And um, the, uh, the picture down here um, is actually a group of us calibrating the instruments. So uh, we're, we calibrate the instruments against each other so that we can compare data over time. And the partners of MCOA also benefit not only from the data itself, but from sharing technology and technical support, access to these um, individuals like Kathleen and Larry and others who provide technical support and uh, do everything from training us to supporting the calibration project um, every, every so often. The communication between the partners has been very important in standardizing the methodology and we continue to work on that over time. So Kathleen is now going to talk um, more specifically about some of the data related to the flow in the estuaries. So Kathleen, feel free to take it away and I'll watch the chat box. Okay, Sarah, I think it, it's one slide too far along. Oh, my apologies. Well, that's okay. You're right. Okay, um, actually this is a good point to answer the question from Alicia. Um, I think I think it was from Alicia or yes. get about buffering capacity. Yes, it was. So we haven't really talked very much about that, but one of the reasons that the Gulf of Maine is, is more susceptible to acidification than other um, seawater, uh, other ocean, ocean areas, ocean waters, is that we get a lot of fresh water from the uh, St. Lawrence and the melting um, ice and it comes around Nova Scotia and comes in through that northeast channel into the Gulf of Maine. So our seawater isn't quite as saline as you would find in a lot of places. And in seawater, the, the more saline the seawater, and buffering capacity is kind of a complicated thing. So I'm just going to try to say it Hopefully I'll be able to, to say it in a way that makes sense. Um, so the seawater, the, the more concentrated the seawater, the more buffering capacity it has. And what that means is when that carbonic acid that Sarah was showing that, that forms when CO2 enters the water, that acid, it releases hydrogen ions, but because there are compounds in seawater that also take up those hydrogen ions, the water doesn't become as acidic as if you were to put the same amount of CO2 in fresh water. And that's because of the buffering capacity. So Maine, Gulf of Maine waters don't have the buffering capacity of a, a more saline seawater because of that. And um, so, so the effect that that CO2 in the water has is kind of dependent on the buffering capacity. And the question was um, how you consider potential freshwater buffering capacity in the form of carbonate alkalinity and organic alkalinity from freshwater sources and how you think about coastal acidification now and in the future. So um, we don't have a lot of carbonate coming from land. In some places you do. It, you have carbonate soils and we don't really have a lot of that happening here. So what we do get is buffering capacity from organic material because it's the same thing. I had mentioned humic material from a bog, that tea water. That also has material that can neutralize those hydrogen ions so that if you put, you know, if you were to pour acid you know, you took a little bit of hydrochloric acid and poured it in that humic water from a bog and, you know, some other uh, fresh water and seawater, you'd get a different change in pH with each of them because some of them have buffers in there that, that neutralize that acid. 
so in coastal areas, you have to be really careful about um, measuring alkalinity because uh, this is a lot more complicated than I really wanted to get into. But but we do have organic alkalinity in some of these estuaries, not, and it's much more significant in some than in others. And the, and again, this is why we have to study each estuary individually. Um, and I don't want to get into a lot of detail about buffering and alkalinity and it, because it's it's beyond what we want to deal with. But if anybody is interested in corresponding with me. Um, after I'd be more than happy to do that. So Sarah had mentioned the different flow of fresh water in the estuaries. And if you look at, at these estuaries, we've got St. George, Madama, Damerska, Sheepskate, Kennebec, they all kind of look the same from a satellite, you know, and you'd say, oh, they're about the same. But if you look in the pie chart in the lower right, this is the annual flow sort of comparatively. So the Kennebec is that sort of brick colored, that's the majority of the flow. So these are all the MCOA estuaries in the pie chart. And the Kennebec is way more flow than all of the other ones combined. So again, fresh water dominates the Kennebec system. There's just so much fresh water coming in from, from that huge area of the state that it drains. So to look at the, the flow in the other estuaries, you really have to take the Kennebec out of that pie chart, which is what we do on the next slide. So the Kennebec's gone, and now we can compare the, the um, estuaries that have lesser flow. So the dark blue is the St. George, the green is the Sheepskit, light blue, the Madamuk, then the Damascata, and then the West Keg, the Harrisigat, and Rockport both have very small um, freshwater input. But one thing I want to uh, mention is, again, we have a group in Rockport and in the West Keg, and even though there isn't much freshwater input, if somebody dumps, you know, if somebody's septic system fails, it can have a major effect on a small system. I mean, one failed septic system could really have an effect on a small watershed. And you, um, we'll get into this a little bit more when we talk about nitrogen again, but um, again, this is just a comparative to show you how different these estuaries are and um, that it's important to study even an estuary that looks very small. And I think we're ready for that. Okay. So this is another way of saying the, the same thing that we were just saying about the Kennebec. And this is from, this is a mean surface salinity for all of the data we had from 2014 to 2018. So you're looking down bird's eye view at the surface. So it's the first meter, I believe, of water averaged. And red is kind of close to the seawater we usually have on the coast of Maine. And you can see that purple green area, that's the Kennebec. So compared to all the other estuaries, there's a lot of fresh water coming in. And remember what we said about the pH of fresh water, it's, it's lower, it's more acidic than seawater. Okay. And this is the mean total nitrogen for the same thing, 2014, 2018 surface total nitrogen. And these are samples that Celeste, many, many samples Celeste has collected over the years. And the, if you look, um, the estuaries aren't labeled on this, but if you look in the upper right, there's a red area. And then to the left of that is another reddish area. That's the head of the um, St. George and the Madamuk. So the one farthest to the right, that's Thomaston, around Thomaston. And the one on the left is Waldeboro. And we've had, an issue with high TN in, in um, those areas. The Kennebec is, you know, kind of in the middle as far as these estuaries go, but remember that it's putting way more water into the Gulf of Maine than the other estuaries. So even though the, the concentration per liter of nitrogen going into the Gulf and along the coast might be low, it's putting in a lot of water. So these are just snapshots of, of what's happening as far as concentration goes, but it's a dynamic system. So 
when we do our calculation about what's flowing in, into the Gulf of Maine and the impact on the Gulf of Maine, we need to take into account concentration times flow, right? To, and some of these areas that are quite high may have very low flow. But if you see an area that's, that's consistently high in total nitrogen, this is an area you want to investigate a little further. And a couple of other things to note um, that, Sarah, can you point out the West Keg? over to the right of the St. George, the blue, the West Keg. It's the blue blob. <laughs> anyway, to the right, 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 yes, that. Okay, so the West Keg is consistently low. And then if you go down to Booth Bay, we see consistently low total nitrogen in Booth Bay, which is, it kind of makes sense because it's, it's more open, it's more, but Booth Bay is, is quite built up right in the harbor. And so that's one of the things we're really interested in finding out is why with all the inputs you would expect to see in Booth Bay in the summer, why the total nitrogen remains low. We can go to the next slide, I think. Okay, so one of the things we do as a, um, just a, an overall big picture is we search for hot spots and there are different ways of doing it but for total nitrogen what i've done here is taken all of the mcoa data from 2014 to 2019 and and just measured the number of times that celeste went out there and found tn above 0.4 milligrams per liter and 0.4 milligrams per liter is sort of an accepted value for when you start to worry about a system. Now, any site, you know, could have, have it happen once. So we can see some, the dark blue dots are all of the MCOA sites that never had nitrogen that high. The very smallest red dots, it only happened once. So, you know, it could be a fluke could be somebody emptied their bilge before Celeste got there. It could be a lot of things. So we're not too worried about those. But where we see it happening again and again, um, we're more worried about it. Now, I will say a caveat here is that these stations have been sampled different numbers of times. And if we were to do a quantitative analysis, we would have to do a percentage of times where it was above 0.4 of all the times we went out. This is just a quick map for us to say, okay, these are where we've had problems in the past. It's qualitative. It's maybe we want to do more testing here. And this happened in the Madomic, which is where you see that big red blob. Um, the upper Madomic is consistently high. So a couple of years ago, I think it was, we decided, well, we, the, we just usually sample in the estuary, but we're going to sample the freshwater above the estuary because we want to know if it's coming from the freshwater or from something that's happening in the village at the head of the estuary. And it turns out for that, you know, maybe all but one or maybe all um, of the times we've sampled, the freshwater has been even higher. So it looks like whatever is happening, the nitrogen that's coming into the Madomic is coming into the freshwater, um, most of it before the freshwater meets the, the ocean water in town in Waldeboro. So again, these are very useful tools for sleuthing out these hot spots and, um, and also prompting further research. You know, when we see these areas, we try to, to get little projects going to, to try to figure out what's going on. Uh, next slide. And th these are some pH hotspots. And it looks, it looks kind of bad when you look at it like this. There are a lot of them. But um, the blue dots, again, pH can be low once for a lot of reasons. We don't worry too much about the ones you see in blue. The ones you see in black uh, um, never had a pH below 7.8. Now, we use 7.8 because that is just a, a good cutoff point for where we might start to um, to look into 
this further to see if maybe there's coastal acidification going on. Where we really want to get a handle on is where we see a, this happening over and over. Now in the Kennebec, it's happening over and over. But if you recall, the Kennebec has that fresh water. Fresh water is naturally lower uh, in pH than salt water. So we don't really worry a whole lot about that unless we see a, a really high total nitrogen at the same time. So I think we cannot worry too much about the Kennebec. We expect that pH to be low. Um, the sheepskit and the Damariscotta had some low pHs. Most of those were in 2014. And I'll just briefly say in 2014, something strange happened. We still haven't figured out what it was, but we had this um, in August and September, this deep layer of cold, saline, low DO, low pH water that came up into the estuaries. And it came up furthest in the sheepskit where you have that deep channel and to a lesser degree in the St. George and the Madama and some of the other estuaries, but we saw it almost in everywhere we were sampling at the time. It, I, we don't really know what caused it. We haven't seen anything really like it since, but a lot of the red in the sheepskit and the Damariscotta was, and the St. George was during that 2014 when that phenomenon happened. And it was very concerning because you have deep, you know, you have the rock going on at the bottom. You have this deep, low pH water. Well, where are all of the commercially viable species in Maine? You know, they live on the bottom. So it's concerning when this happens. Um, and it's, if what, the one of the reasons we want to control coastal acidification, of course, is because so many people depend on on that to make a living. They depend on it for fisheries, lobsters, clams. They, if you think about most of the things we harvest, they're on the bottom. But we're, we're still, you know, if it happens again, we'll be ready to go out there and measure it extensively because um, we really don't understand what happened that year. But um, the Madamuk, um, I wish I could, can you highlight the Madamuk, Sarah? Um, that's a Damariscotta. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. Okay, so the Madamic has some consistent problems as well. And if you recall, that was the estuary with the really high nitrogen. So it's all kind of coming together there, right? There's something that needs to be dealt with in the Madamic. And then last year for the first year, um, whoops. I'm so sorry. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. We started measuring in Belfast and there were some low pHs in Belfast. Um, and we've only, we've only analyzed there once. Um, so the fact that we found a lot of lower pHs is probably significant um, and it will be interesting to see what happens if we go out, if we're able to go out this year. Um, and just as an aside, I, I grew up in Maine and I, uh, I remember Belfast Harbor being full of chicken feathers and chicken feet. And, <laughs> um, so I want to, I want to, I have measurements from Belfast Harbor from the 70s and 60s and areas were just dead. You know, nothing, nothing was living there. So I, I also want to have, um, I want to give a shout out to the Clean Water Act. And, you know, we need to fight to keep that intact because those of us who are old enough remember, you know, rivers that catch on, caught on fire and chicken guts flowing in <laughs> through Belfast Harbor. So um, we've come a long way and um, we would just want to continue this monitoring um, so that we're aware of the changes that are going on and can make informed decisions. And if anybody wants to talk to, I think this is my, is this my last slide, Sarah? It is. I'm sorry. Okay, so if anybody wants to talk further technical issues, um, I don't really want to get too technical here and, and bore people who aren't really interested in that, but if anybody wants to contact me, um, will you be sending our 
email, Sarah, to everyone? or I certainly can, and my email is at the end of this presentation, and so okay. anyone who has a question for Kathleen can okay. send it to me. Um, so that's fine. Okay. Yeah. I can share. Actually, I can share. Uh, Kathleen, why don't you go ahead and share your email in the chat? Yeah, I can do that. That'd be great. So as as Kathleen was talking about, you know, what can what can we do? What can you do? What can I do? Um, and Kathleen came up with a good slogan. She says, monitor, manage, and mitigate. So, you know, we can we can document the changes as they happen um, through the data, but we do need we do need water quality data to do that. We can manage at a community and even a household level. We can make the changes that we need to make. We can control erosion or minimize um, the impact of animal waste by disposing of it properly. We can um, manage what kind of fertilizers we use and how and when we use them, all those kinds of things. And then we can mitigate. We can make um, you know big changes as we need to when there are problems. So um, MCO is really interested in seeing this, um, the science result in science-based decision making through our data. And we're really interested in getting the data to the public so that it's not shelved. And this is really important information for our communities to, to have. Um, so we would like to do more presentations like this. And then um, the place-based science education and policy with regional context. So that's that's what this is. This is um, you know a regional a regional look at a, a an international problem, but also a, a a local. There are local controls that we can put in place specifically around um, coastal acidification. I'm sorry, I've had some issues with my cursor, and I can't always see it. So I apologize during this presentation for some of the weird cursor things. I couldn't always tell where it was. Um, but so on the left, you'll see and um, Robert Jordan, who's instrumental in our website um, creation. And, and our website is, is mcoa, mcoa science.org. <clears throat> and you can go on there and take a look. One of the things that's on there is our 2014 report, which is a pretty extensive report that um, documents some of those things that Kathleen was talking about. So if you're interested specifically in what was going on in 2014, I want to really call a huge thank you and call out to all of our volunteers, our technical team, to Celeste um, for all the hard work she does on the boats and with volunteers, to our funders, and with a, a huge um, thank you to our partnering organizations, so Friends of Casco Bay, the Booth Bay Regional Land Trust, Kelt, the Rockport Group, um, the Conservation Commission, the George's River Tidewater. I'm sorry, that's not correct. That's the wrong. That's the wrong logo. <laughs> My apologies for the uh, the George's River Land Trust, Friends of the West Keg, Mid Coast Conservancy, and Coastal Rivers Conservation Trust, and more recently, Friends of, Cat of Belfast Bay and the Hurricane Island Foundation. So that's my email on the bottom left, sbladzu at coastalrivers.org. I'm happy to forward things um, to Kathleen and, um, and I can answer um, some questions as well. 